keep us on guidance and protect us from misguidance. <clears throat> In our previous khutbah, we looked at the third source of Muslim culture, or what we called cultural Islam, as distinct from Islamic culture. Islamic culture being the culture which grows from the true foundations of Islam from the pillars of Islam and Iman, faith, the pillars of Ihsan, righteousness, goodness. The various teachings of Islam which address Allah in particular, our theology, and the teachings which address our social interactions as well as the teachings which address our character, our moral character, which we said, in fact, is the core of Islam. That Islam is fundamentally a moral message. The culture which is produced by applying that moral message is what we call Islamic culture. Whereas the culture which Muslim people may exhibit in different places and at different times, which may or may not have a link with Islamic culture, we refer to that as cultural Islam. <clears throat> And we said it was very important for us to understand that distinction because the main problem facing Muslims today is the inability to distinguish between cultural Islam and Islamic culture. This is the main problem. We have other problems, which are political problems, the occupation of Palestine, the attacks in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you know, these are, there are many, many political problems which exist, Darfur and etc., around the Muslim world. Wherever we go in the Muslim world, we seem to have problems. But these problems come and go. If we look through the history of the Islamic nation, we see that at different points in times they had these problems. People occupied certain areas of Palestine. This is not the first time Palestine has been occupied. It was occupied by the Crusaders for 100 years. We think that the situation in Palestine is so bad right now so intolerable right now. Think about that era in which the Crusaders occupied Palestine. When they didn't even allow the Adhan to be called from Masjid al-Aqsa. For 100 years, no Adhan. No Salah. Is the situation today worse? Or is it in fact better? We have to say, today is not so bad. It is not so bad. It's not good. I'm not saying it's good, it's all right, we should be happy with it. But it's not so bad. We have gone through worse periods. There was a period when an insane group which evolved from the Shia, they were known as the Qaramita who were based in Eastern Arabia, in Ahsa. They attacked Mecca. They massacred the pilgrims, the Hujjaj, threw their bodies down the well of Zamzam. 
took the black stone from the Kaaba and kept it out in Ahsa for 23 years. This is political history. We've had trials in the past. It was returned. So these trials, the Ummah, the Muslim nation has gone through over the history. But the issue of Islam itself, this is the most critical issue. Issue of true Islam, knowing what true Islam is, this is the most critical issue. Because the ability to correct the wrongs which face the Muslim Ummah today can only come through Islamic culture. The correct understanding of Islam from its authentic sources. This is the only way that we can correct it. As for the political wranglings and dealings and things which go on in the world today, it will not change the reality. It won't. The only and most critical area that is absolutely necessary is to revive Islam itself in its purity. To bring back Islamic culture to its forefront, its proper place. Give it its proper place in our lives. So that wherever we are, whether as a huge minority in India or as a small minority in Guyana, South America, or as the majority in Pakistan or Egypt, wherever we are, we are able to effectively live our lives in a way pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this should be our goal. That whatever place, position, circumstance we are in, we try to apply Islam in a way which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam is always kept at the forefront. It is the criterion by which we determine right and wrong. Whether in our jobs, when the manager asks us to do something, or a workmate asks us to do something else, we judge whether to do these things or not according to what Islam has to say on the matter. This is our criterion. Not whether we want to get a raise or a promotion, that becomes our determining factor. Shall we do it or shall we not do it? We know it's not right, but we decide whether to do it or not, whether we want that promotion. The boss is telling us, if you want that promotion, then help me out and I'll help you out. Then you have to stand your ground. This is the moral ground that you have to stand on. Knowing that what he is asking is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't do it. You forego the promotion because that promotion will not be blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your paycheck will increase. Your paycheck will increase. So it seems that more money is going into your bank account. However, that money is cursed because you have earned it through illegitimate means. And that is more important. That issue is more important to you than what that money can buy. Because we're going to leave this world and whatever we have bought, we can't take with us. 
somebody else will take it. That's the reality. So, our goal should be understanding Islamic culture and applying it in our lives. So we looked at the obstacles. The first major obstacle we said was inherited customs from pre-Islamic sources. Before Islam came to our part of the world, we used to do certain things. Maybe it was a result of pagan practices of our region or certain religious, particular religions that existed in our re region before. At any rate, when our forefathers accepted Islam, they brought in some of these practices with them. So we are living that legacy. We have to correct it. Or it is a result of adopted practices. Muslims were fine for a period of time until some people decided, well, these other people who are another nation next to us are doing certain things and it looks nice, it seems to be uh, good. So we adopt those practices. The third source, which we spoke about last week, was the source of spiritual innovation, which came under the general heading of Sufism. This week, and we should just point out that the main danger of what is known as Sufism is intermediacy. Intermediacy meaning that people are placed between us and Allah. As I said before, if being a Sufi in your eyes or in the eyes of those around you means you are a person trying to practice Islam properly, praying five times daily, fasting, doing exact additional prayers, avoiding the trappings of this world, living a simple life, and they call you by that Sufi, they give you that title Sufi, then that's fine, that's Islam. It's zuhud, that's the actual term which is used in Arabic. And that's how Prophet Muhammad wasallam was. That's how he was. So that's fine. But if by Sufism, one means striving to become one with Allah. And this is the essential teachings in the various branches of Sufism. Whether it's the Shadiliya, or the Tijaniya, or the Qadiriya, or any of the major Naqshbandiya and Chistiya, and all of these various orders of Sufis, Sufism, they ultimately call to the concept that you, a human being, can become one with Allah. That your soul, the soul which is within you, is a part of Allah is a piece of the divine and that your goal in life the real goal is to make that part of yourself which is divine unite with Allah the ultimate divinity that is Greek philosophy Hindu religion and everything else but Islam But the real danger of that philosophy, as we said, is that in the course of reaching that point, people are taught that there are others who have already reached that point. And if you want your prayers to be accepted by Allah and help you get up to reach that point, then it's best for you to call on these others. And they're given various titles. So, in times of dire need and necessity, trials and tribulations, you find Muslims in some parts of the world calling out, on who? Allah? Oh Allah, help me? No. 
Oh, Abdul Qadir, help me. Ya Abdul Qadir, aghithni. Oh, Abdul Qadir, save me. That is shirk. And that is the evil and the danger that lies in this way, an alternative way for the Sharia. Called by those who follow it, the haqiqa, the reality. Sharia is the gross practices of common Muslims, and there is a reality, an inner reality called the haqiqa. And one who hasn't understood that haqiqa has missed the whole purpose. That is falsehood. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu taught the Sharia. Islam came with the Sharia. The Haqiqa is the Sharia. That is the true reality. The fourth source of problems: cultural Islam, which hinders people from understanding true Islam. The fourth source is factionalism. Factionalism. Factionalism which manifested itself in the form of the four madhahib. The four madhabs. Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, and Hanbali. These four madhabs, whose founders did not have the intent of forming madhabs, meaning schools, sects, which people would follow rigidly, that was not their intention at all. Be sure about this point. If you ask Abu Hanifa, what was your madhab? Abu Hanifa was not going to say, I'm a Hanafi. Imam Malik would not have said, I'm a Maliki. Nor would Imam Shafi'i say, I'm a Shafi'i. Nor Imam Ahmed say, I'm a Hanbali. None of them would have said this. So if we are following them, then why are we saying this? We have to ask ourselves. We're not really following them. We're following something else. What their effort was, and if we asked them, what was your madhab? They would have said, our madhab is that of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were following the Prophet's madhab. That's what they were following. The way of the Prophet, the Sunnah. That is the one madhab that stands true in Islamic culture. Everything else that people have created, given names to, all of it is false. As a madhab, it's all false. If it is not another way of saying following the way of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, it may sound somewhat heretical to many of you. He is denying the four madhabs. No, I'm not denying them. I'm not denying the great scholars who these schools of Islamic law are attributed to. And there were many others besides them who you don't even know about. There were not just four, there were many others. Only they dwindled down to four. But these were scholars striving to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ. They made their rulings based on information which came to them in different parts of the Muslim Ummah to help the Muslims follow the way of Rasulullah 
sallallahu alaihi wasallam later generations called that way by the name of the scholar who led the way so they call it the hanafi madhab and we have inherited that tradition so if by hanafi madhab you mean following scholars trying to follow the way of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam according to the efforts made by abu hanifa and those who came after them then there's nothing wrong with that but if by hanafi madhab you mean a particular way which you must follow blindly without knowing why or when or where regarding it is just enough to say i'm a hanafi and that is enough for me any time anybody asks me why do you do this you say i'm a hanafi why do you do that i'm a hanafi if that becomes what hanafiya means to you then you are lost you've lost the way because the only person that we should follow in that way is rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's why it is in our declaration of faith ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah i bear witness that there's no god worthy of worship but allah and that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the messenger of allah that declaration that he was the messenger of allah means that i will follow him blindly if somebody asks me why are you doing that you say because i'm a follower of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam why are you doing this it's because that's what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did that's okay you don't understand no i don't necessarily understand but i'm following it because he said do it even if you don't understand he said do it do it that is only for him alone for anybody else we need to understand as best as we can we need to understand as best as we can and we don't follow anyone else blindly but muslim history unfortunately reached a point where these scholarly efforts to follow the way of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam degenerated into four different religions while calling itself islam it had degenerated into four different religions so much so that around the kaaba for centuries around the kaaba itself the most important pillar of islam salah was prayed four times each congregation led by an imam from one of the four madhabs that is something unthinkable maybe to us today we look at said yeah is that true look at all of the old pictures you go on the internet google kaaba and they'll show you images from the kaaba which were photographed in the early part of the 20th century late 19th century you look at all of those and you will see structures around the kaaba which are not there now today each one of those structures canopies had a name one was called maqam hanafi we know about maqam ibrahim now but they had also maqam hanafi added maqam shafi maqam hanbali and maqam maliki and when the time for salah came adhan was made when the time for the iqama came then the hanafi imam would stand under the hanafi canopy they would make the iqama and all the hanafis who were making umrah who were in the masjid they would line up and pray behind him when his salah was finished then the shafi imam would get up 
and all of the Shafi'is would pray behind him, and so on and so forth. What do you think of that? That is degeneration. Allah tells us in the Quran, وَاَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold on firmly to the rope of Allah together as one group and don't split up. What is that? That is the exact opposite of the message of the Quran. So, it is incumbent on us to find our way back to the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To make his way our true and ultimate madhab. Meaning that when information comes to us, when we see people doing things contrary to what we do, we ask, we find out. We get to the sources as much as we can. And if we find that there is evidence to support practices, that we didn't know about, then we go according to the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because that's what Abu Hanifa said. He said, Imam Abu Hanifa said, if the hadith, if the statement of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or his practice is authentic, then that is my madhab. And Imam Shafi said exactly the same thing. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal and Imam Malik both said similar things. So they made it clear that that is what people are supposed to do. They led the way and we should follow in that spirit. Imam al-Shafi studied under Imam Malik for more than 20 years. He was his student. And it wasn't until Imam Malik died that Imam Shafi set off to teach himself. He went to Yemen, from there to Baghdad. He studied under the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, because Abu Hanifa had died already. And he taught, he wrote a book called Al Hujja, compiling the rulings based on what he had learned from Imam Malik and the students from Abu Hanifa. Then he went on to Egypt to study under Imam Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad, who most of us have never heard about, who was a contemporary of Imam Malik. And when he got there, Imam Al-Layth had already died, so he studied under the students of Imam Al-Layth. And after studying under the students of Imam al-Layth and absorbing the knowledge which Imam al-Layth was teaching, he then changed his opinions on many of the things that he had concluded based on his studies in Medina and Iraq. And he wrote a new book called Al-Um with new rulings, correcting and changing his previous rulings. And he settled in Egypt. And his way, his methodology, his teaching became the dominant teaching. So now we know Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i, Egypt, Imam al Layth, who ever heard of him? Nobody heard about him. But he was, in fact, by proxy, the teacher of Imam al Shafi'i. That was the way. Imam al-Shafi demonstrated the way to seek knowledge and to understand it. To be willing to change one's rulings, even with the stature that he had, he had no problem switching from rulings which he wrote in al-Hujjah to rulings which he wrote in al um No problem. So why do we have problems today? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us back to the way of our righteous forefathers who sought knowledge for the sake of Allah and who taught that knowledge for the pleasure of Allah who were not afraid to change when the truth came to them and who 
had the courage to stand behind the truth regardless of those who oppose them. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. I ask Allah to forgive myself and yourselves and call on you to turn to Him to seek His forgiveness because none can forgive sin besides Him. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. So brothers and sisters, today the impact of the madhab perhaps is not as great in our lives. I spoke about the time which is past. It ended actually only in 1925. Those four prayers around the Kaaba stopped in 1925. When King Abdul Aziz and his followers took over Arabia, took over Mecca and Medina, and destroyed those structures which were around the Kaaba, and insisted that only one prayer would take place in Mecca. The Imam, regardless of his madhab, would be followed by everyone. 1925. So it's not so long ago. Maybe before many of us were born, most of us were born, but still not that long ago. And I should add that for hundreds of years, it was ruled, a ruling was made in the Hanafi madhab that it was not permissible for a Hanafi to marry a Shafi'i. Not permissible for a Hanafi to marry a Shafi'i. Can you imagine that? And this is why I said it deteriorated into different religions. Because we cannot marry Hindus, but we can marry Christians. Muslim men can marry Christian women, but we can't marry Hindus, women or men, unless they convert to Islam. So, by saying that the Hanafi could not marry a Shafi'i, is like saying you can't marry a Hindu. That's very serious. And it lasted for hundreds of years. This ruling lasted for hundreds of years. Till today, if you go to the masjid in, in, in Syria and Damascus, etc., you will find in the, those masjids built from the era of the 13th century, 14th century onwards, they will have two mihrabs. You see this mihrab? They have two. One for Hanafi, one for Shafi'i. Yes. The relics still remain. And we do find in some masjids in different parts of the Muslim world where there are communities of both Shafi'is and Hanafis. For Asr time, you'll have a prayer timetable for Hanafis and a prayer timetable for Shafi'is. What does that say? Still elements of it are still alive amongst us today. But the greater the greater harm which faces us today is the factionalism which came from the movements of the 20th century, 20th century. There were movements which arose with the intent of correcting the ills of colonization of the Muslim Ummah by the colonial powers. Movements arose in resistance to these forces of colonization. Good intent. But what tended to happen is that in time, these movements, after their successes or their failures, whatever, these movements took on a life of their own. 
they became jamaat and they took on names and they began to look at people who were not a part of their jamaa as being misguided if you weren't in our jamaa if you're not a member you have not made bay'a to our leader then you're lost not only are you lost I start to look at you as the enemy if you're not with us then you're against us so my da'wah instead of being da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it becomes da'wah to my group my organization my movement and that was misguidance because Islam doesn't deny the need for organization organizations are beneficial as a means not an end we have made these organizations under a variety of different names ends instead of being means and because their ends their goals that's why we call to them rather than calling to Allah so if we hear of a person who is a new Muslim the first thing we're going to ask him about is which jama'ah or which group he belongs to and if he doesn't belong to our group then we have to try to pull him into our group and that is more important to us than his growth islamically we're trying to build membership our whole dawah is increasing our numbers when we, our da'wah or our call should be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mu'idhati al-hasana. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and wise preachings. And that was the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is why we are commanded in Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayuhu alladhina amunu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. We are called to seek Allah's peace and blessings for Prophet Muhammad ﷺ because he is the one who showed us the way. A way which was free from factionalism. Not a way without differences because it doesn't mean the Sahaba did not, his the companions of the Prophet ﷺ did not differ. They differed. They had different opinions. They disagreed. But they didn't allow those differences to split their ranks so that one couldn't pray behind another. And that is what we have let happen to us today. So we need to go back to the way which Rasulullah left, which he called us to the way of the Quran and the Sunnah. <coughs> A way which calls to the unity of Muslims. And the unity of Muslims giving, giving precedence over our differences. Resolving differences. Correcting. Seeking to understand what is the better way. We do that. But not at the expense of the unity of Muslims. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us back to the united way. Back to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To remove from our hearts our factionalism, our feelings of uh, groupism which split our ranks. I ask Allah to help us to find the truth with regards to the way of Islam and to be willing to give up whatever we have held on to all these years simply for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I ask Allah to make our hearts pure, free from rancor, ill feelings towards our fellow Muslims. 
that he bring our hearts together as only he can and that we die leaving this world as believers in him. The world's first tuition free degree, BA in Islamic Studies. Access the knowledge any place, anytime, anywhere. It just doesn't get any easier than that. Classes, texts, assignments, completely online. Set your own schedule for the semester. No overseas travel required for the exams. Subjects taught by qualified English speaking scholars. Weekly live sessions in virtual classrooms. With curricula based on those in El Medina University in Saudi Arabia, El Azhar University in Cairo, and other reputable institutions around the world. Why wait any longer? You pay just a symbolic registration fee and are ready to begin the adventure of higher education. The most diverse student body of any university in the world. 130,000 plus registered students from 217 countries. Log in to the website for more details. www.islamiconlineuniversity.com